you. In 1945, all the airplanes had piston engines, like that. That's a B-29. Then something radical happened. Over the next decade, they all changed to turbines. That's the first commercial jet airliner, the de Havilland Comet, first flew in 1952. Within a decade, they'd all changed. Really radical, fast transformation. Why? Two reasons, power and reliability. This is kind of the pinnacle of piston engine development for airplanes. That's a Pratt & Whitney R4360. It means it's a 28-cylinder, 28 28-piston 28 radial engine. It makes about 3,000 horsepower. It weighs about 3,000 pounds. Um, they weren't very reliable. The time between overhauls was about 600 hours. At the speed they flew, that meant maybe 10 trips across the Pacific and back. And if you did fly the Pacific in one, um, an airplane with four of these, you had a pretty good chance one of them would fail. That's why there were four of them. <laughs> That's a turbine engine. That one is also a Pratt & Whitney product, a J58. It's the Blackbird engine. Um, first fired up in 1958. It weighs about 6,000 pounds, about twice the weight of that piston engine. But instead of 3,000 horsepower, it makes 160,000 horsepower. Put two of those in a Blackbird, you can fly at Mark III, 2,200 miles an hour. That's not even vaguely possible with piston engines. That one's running in a ground test. You can see it's um, strapped to the ground and uh, make quite a lot of power. Um, I don't know the, the numbers for that particular engine, but modern turbofan engines uh, will do 10,000 hours between overhauls. Some do 30,000. You fly the Pacific in, uh, in one of these things, a 777, 400 seats, only two engines. I just did that uh, 13 hours across the Pacific. It didn't even occur to me that I might have to swim. The, the, en <laughs> the, the engines just don't fail. Um, so it took over airplanes, but not cars and trucks. Why not? Chrysler built a, a turbine car in 1962. It failed. <laughs> and you don't see any turbine cars or trucks these days. Well, turbines are great for airplanes and ships and power stations where you run at continuous high power. But they've got some serious problems if you want to use them in automotive. Uh, three that I'll talk about. The first is that they're only efficient at full power. Uh, at idle power, they still burn a lot of fuel just to keep going. Um, and the problem with cars, of course, is that, you know, modern car, family cars, maybe 200 horsepower, takes about 20 horsepower to drive up the road at 30 miles an hour, and you idle a lot. So the fuel efficiency just kills it. And then they're very slow to respond to throttle changes. They don't have throttles, but when you ask them for more power, it takes a long time. Uh, you've all been in a commercial airplane, you get to the end of the runway, they open the throttles, and, you know, three seconds later, you start rolling. That's okay for airplanes, but not so much for cars. And then turbine engines are expensive. Now, the first two of those I can make just vanish. Like this. So this is a cutaway drawing of a garbage truck. And cut away half the chassis and two of the back wheels so that you can see what's going on. And the conventional diesel engine and battery packs and prop shaft and differential, sorry, diesel engine and transmission, and prop shaft and differentials are all gone. Now there's battery packs there. There's electric motors driving the wheels, one per wheel, about 250 horsepower each with a four-speed gearbox. And there's a turbine engine driving a generator. We'll leave that aside for a moment. So think of this as just an electric garbage truck. The power comes from the battery pack, and the motors can deliver peak about 1,000 horsepower to the wheels to accelerate or to decelerate. All comes from the battery pack or goes back into the battery pack. All that the turbine engine does is generate electricity to keep the battery charged. So it runs at about a tenth of that power, and we never idle it. Any time we run that engine, it runs at the speed and load that gives you the peak efficiency. When the battery's full, we shut it off. So we don't care anymore about what the efficiency is at low power. We don't care that it takes many seconds to ramp up to full power, it simply doesn't matter. So those barriers to using turbines in land vehicles are just gone. 
What about the cost problem? Well, that comes from the fact that there really aren't any high volume, low cost applications for turbine engines. They're all aircraft and military and power stations. But there is a related technology that is high volume and low cost. It is turbochargers. They make about 10 million of those a year for 150 bucks. Now, I don't sell them to you for 150 bucks, but that's what it costs to make them. <laughs> and they're actually not very different. This is part of our turbine engine. I'm holding it. You see how big it is? Um, that's the low, the low pressure compressor. And it's not too different from what you find in a turbocharger. It's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit fancier in shape, but you can make them the same way for the same kind of price. So what if you made a, a turbine engine using turbocharger technology, using automotive manufacturing materials and techniques? Could you drive the cost down? Yes, you can. So we have done that. This is our new turbine engine. It kind of looks like a couple of turbochargers because it kind of is. There's two compressor stages, two turbine stages. There's a combustor over here where you burn the fuel. And there's a generator in here in electronics where you make electricity. So you put fuel in here and you get electricity out here. It's an 80 kilowatt generator, weighs about 300 pounds. It'll run 10,000 hours. So it has the same advantages that you get in aircraft, the power to weight and the durability. What about emissions? Can you put a catalytic converter on those things? Happily, you don't have to. So turbines have a completely different combustion process than piston engines. So the picture on the left um, is a simulation, an artist rendering of what happens in a diesel engine, where you compress the air, get it hot, you inject some fuel, fine spray of droplets, and because the air is above the auto ignition temperature, then the fuel starts to burn. But you've got to start the fire every cycle. You'll notice it's a bright yellow flame like a candle flame. It's not a pale blue flame like a turbine flame. That's because it's full of incandescent soot particles, just like a candle. If you put a spoon over a candle, it goes black straight away, the soot. The particles are incandescent when they're in the flame, but they turn into black soot when they go out the exhaust. That's why the old diesels used to leave a trail of black smoke behind them. Now there's a particulate filter to stop that. But the particles are still there. The turbine is a continuous combustion process, like a blowtorch. So the fuel burns in a flame tube, you inject the fuel here, and you inject the air in as it's going down, and by the time it gets to the end, everything is burnt. You see, there's no flame there. All the hydrocarbons are burnt, all the CO is burnt to CO2, all the particulates are gone. There really wasn't much to begin with. The flame is pale blue, there aren't particulates, and they're glowing incandescently. You can see the exhaust pretty hot, it's very clean. So you can make turbines very, very low emissions. In fact, if you build a vehicle with a turbine range extender, it can be cleaner than an EV, cleaner than an electric vehicle. How is that possible? Well, oh yeah, I forgot that, but that's our actual combustor and the actual flame, I'm very attached to that. <laughs> um, well, that happens because this is where electricity comes from. That's a coal-fired power station in China. And I think you can get an idea of the air quality from that picture. Um, most people don't know this, but 41% of the world's electricity comes from burning coal. And it's not just the 82% in China and the 79% in India and the 70-something percent in Australia and nearly 50% in... Germany and England and 40% in the US. It's not just that. It's the fact that almost all of the growth in electricity generation comes from coal. The Chinese are building one of these a week. We've, we've increased coal consumption in the world about 50% over the last decade for this. So if you can do better than the average mix of power generation, yeah, in New Zealand that's really tough, but in the US it's not. If you can do better than the average mix of electricity generation with a turbine as the range extender, you can make that vehicle cleaner than just a straight plug-in vehicle. Okay. Electric cars. We've had them for 100 years. 
I narrowly missed out on buying that thing. It's just gorgeous. It's a 1903 Columbus Electric. Still runs after 120 years. Um, no oil leaks. <laughs> Battery's a bit tired, but the, the rest of it is great. Um, 100 years later, this is what you could buy. When we started Tesla, this is what was on the road. It was electric vehicles you could buy. I'm going to let these pass without comment. Things, <laughs> things got a lot better in 2008, and better again in 2012. Those are really nice cars. I don't have any Tesla stock anymore, it's okay. <laughs> in fact, I don't even drive one of those. I'm very fond of my Maserati. It, uh, sounds really nice. <laughs> OK, the plug-in vehicle market in the US is stuck at half a percent. Despite the fact that there's lots of nice electric and plug-in vehicles you can buy, it's half a percent of the market, and it's not changing. Why is that? I think that's because we asked the wrong question. If you got a room full of smart people, hi, um, and you said, how do we make more efficient cars? Well, people might be inclined to say, well, what's the most efficient car we have and how can we make it better? So we might take something that does you know, 40 miles per gallon and make it electric. You might do that. They did do that. Lots of people did that. The problem is that that car that did 40 miles per gallon, it only burns about $1,200 a year in fuel. You can only save about $800 a year in fuel costs when you go to electric but you pay $16,000 more for the car. That's a 20-year payback. So you might expect that not too many people would go for that, and not too many people do. What would the right question be? Well, the right question would be, how can we save enough fuel per vehicle per year to make the economics of this compelling, to save enough money to pay for the increased capital cost of the powertrain? Well, what kind of vehicles burn the most fuel in the, in the least efficient manner? What would those vehicles be? Well, they would be these things. In the US, those weigh about 30 tons. They do 130 miles a day on average. They do 1,000 hard stops, triggering the ABS on most of the stops. The engine in that would do five or six miles per gallon. If it's used in a long haul truck, they do 2.6. They burn 14,000 gallons a year. They chew up the brakes in three months. Maybe we could do those electric. Yeah, not so much. That's... <laughs> That's how much battery you need. If you want to cover the minus 40C and the longer routes, and you don't want to use all the battery charge because that wears the battery out, that's what you need. About half a million dollars worth of batteries, about half the payload, about half the space. Not really practical. What if you used a range extender? Then you only need three battery packs. And you can do whatever route length you want, because the batteries supply the peak power. And yes, they give you the first 20, maybe 30 miles on energy you got from the grid, if you want to do that. But then the turbine range extender kicks on. And so long as you've got fuel, you can keep going. Um, if you do that, you can save more than half the fuel. You can make the brakes last approximately the life of the vehicle. You can save something in the order of $50,000 a year in operating costs. But, and so although the powertrain for that costs about 10 times as much as it does for an electric car, you save 60 times as much fuel. So the scaling properties of this make this economically compelling. Um, and because it's economically compelling, it's going to take over. Can you even move something as heavy as a 30-ton truck with electric motor? Sure you can. Um, that's the Queen Mary II. It weighs 75,000 tons, and the only thing that moves it are four little electric motors at the back here driving props. OK, they're 28,000 horsepower electric motors, but... <laughs> We've been making trains move with electric motors for a very long time. That's an 1896 electric locomotive, electric motors driving the wheels. In this case, it gets its electricity from a rail. We still do that. They go a bit faster these days. Um, we run diesel electric locomotives. They have electric motor per drive wheel on the locomotive, and they pull freight trains weighing 10,000 tons. Sure, we can do it. It's not a problem. That's how we do it in the garbage trucks. Same thing as a locomotive. There's a motor per wheel. 
So the motor drives a four-speed gear reduction, the final drive, an axle out to the wheel. Same thing's repeated for the other side. So there's one motor per wheel, just like a locomotive, but they're geared. Um, that works. OK. 70 years ago, turbines completely displaced piston engines in large aircraft. If you use a combination of turbines and batteries and electric motors, you can transform the least fuel efficient trucks, vehicles, and the ones with the worst emissions, making them in some cases even cleaner than EVs. And you can save so much money by doing that that the economics are compelling. And that means that the diesel engine is going to be completely displaced from those applications. I can't wait. Thank you.